when I became a monk, I had these great expectations. I was very gung-ho and very determined, not so much as other people. Some of the other people who were ordained were very religious, very devout. I was more interested in building. And one of the questions that I had as a beginner was which is the correct form of meditation? Because there is a feeling that, well, any way that you can meditate is okay. This is my meditation, worked for me, and that is your meditation, works for you. There's a lot of merit in this idea. We are all trying to figure it out. We're all trying to work out life, universe, and everything. What was it in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? The solution to the entire universe and life. Was it 42? Something like, was that the right number? 42? We're all trying to find that 42, what is the right way? Get too sleepy. Meditate with your eyes closed. Which is the correct way? Which way will get you enlightened faster? Which way is going to take you in the wrong direction? What if I meditate on my stomach and I should be meditating on my nose and I go for years and years and years and then find out I was doing it wrong? Very clearly I had this experience. I was focusing here and then my face sank down. And my face appeared here, and my face was doing this with my abdomen. I thought, oh, this is it. This is meditation. I'm really doing it. I reported it, the experience to the teacher. He said, you must have good concentration. He said, my concentration isn't that good. I was like, wow, I'm better than the teacher. Then some people said, meditate with your eyes open. I didn't like that. Get too sleepy. Meditate with your eyes closed. Which is the correct way? Which way will get you enlightened faster? Which way is going to take you in the wrong direction? What if I meditate on my stomach and I should be meditating on my nose and I go for years and years and years and then find out I was doing it wrong? Some use visualization. You can use colors, light. Traditionally in Buddhism, we use dead bodies. We have uh, skeletons, and sometimes you go and meditate on skeletons. Some Thai temples, we have real skeletons, of real bones. We can use this as a meditation object, which is the right way. There's a story in, from the time of the Buddha of a monk who was told to meditate on dead and dying and decaying bodies. So he would meditate on the idea of like visualization of a decaying body. And sometimes they have, people would die and they bring them to the temple and they leave them there and you can watch them day by day as they, they decay. This particular form of meditation it's not so popular these days. It's probably illegal in America. Probably get sued for traumatizing yogis in America. This particular monk, he came and saw the Buddha. And the Buddha looked into his past lives and saw in his previous lives, he'd always been a goldsmith or jewelry maker. So he said, visualize your body as made from pure gold. And then that man, he got enlightened. So we use this story to point out that there really isn't one correct meditation method. However, there is a point where you have to stop using methods of meditation because whatever form of meditation you are doing will be focusing on a particular object. 
making my mind like this and not like that. So I have this mantra like this, not that. What that means is I'm focusing on this as an object and not everything else. Right now I can focus on the air conditioning, I can focus on the monk beside me, I can focus on my abdomen. If I'm focusing on my abdomen, I'm not listening to the sounds in my ear. If I focus on the sounds in my ear, then I'm not feeling the feeling in my foot. If I'm feeling the feeling in my foot, I'm not remembering a traumatic event from my childhood. If I'm remembering a traumatic event from my childhood, I'm not focusing on loving kindness. It's very important to note this is the way the mind actually works, if you pay attention to it. It moves like a spotlight from one thing to another thing to another thing. And when it's on this thing, it's not any other thing. It's this, not that. So when we do meditation, the meditation object becomes this meditation object, not that other stuff. So if you have a lot of thoughts in your mind, as most people do, can become traumatic, or heavy, and scatter your attention, drain your energy. Buddha said, thinking, even good thinking, will make the body tired. When the body is tired, it will not concentrate. So what you do is you find a meditation object, you use a mantra, visualization, physical feeling of the breath here or there, that dampens out what you were experiencing, the mind, the thoughts, the dis-ease. And now you've replaced it with another object of attention, which is calmer, sweeter, more beautiful, the breath. It's quite beautiful when you pay attention to it. According to Buddhism, Neutral experiences are beautiful when you experience them, but not if you don't experience them. I won't explain that, I'll just leave that with you. It's an interesting idea. So by putting your attention onto your meditation object, you get a feeling of increased peace, increased ease, you get the feeling of you can step out of your normal life and now sit with this object. And whatever object you put your attention on, your mind will take on that characteristic. The breath is quite neutral, it's quite sweet, it's quite repetitive, it's quite soothing. Or as my preceptor used to say, it can console the mind. If you put your attention onto loving kindness, it can become quite bright, quite energetic, and feel quite beautiful. It's called in Buddhism, Sobhana Jitta, beautiful state of mind. But it's this, not that. It's this loving kindness, not the breath, not my thoughts, not my history, not my future. So. All of the meditations that are given, eyes open or eyes closed, on the breath or on the feeling of the seat, or the feeling of the body, visualization, these are all just finding another object, and having this object to replace that object. After a while, it starts to dawn on the meditator that your progress is slight. This stark, powerful, radical transformation, quantum leap, if you like, different way of being, that was enlightenment, that the Buddha and other saints and sages have all attested to. That is not just another object of mind. If you can perfect attention on the breathing, what you have gained is the ability to put attention onto your breathing. If you perfect visualization of light or color, what you have attained to is just a perception of light or color. This insight 
into the way the mind picks up one perception, drops, goes on to another perception, should arouse wisdom because then you start to question, what are you putting your attention on? How do you spend your day? If you pay attention to the news, then you're going to get agitated. The news is designed to agitate, to draw you in, to tribalize, pit people against each other, my group versus that group. It's designed to, especially the modern day news. You know, in the old days of Byzantine Empire, which was the Roman Empire that, as it went to Byzantium, they had a centuries-long battle between two groups called the Blues and the Greens. This is true, look it up. The Blues would hate the Greens and the Greens would hate the Blues and nobody could actually say what the difference is between them. But it's my group, those dirty, filthy, disgusting Greens, and the Greens would be those awful Blues. <laughs> the color-coded, color-coded politics. This divided the Byzantine Empire horribly. They fight and kill each other. So what you put your attention onto will determine that state of mind, will determine the kind of person, the kind of life that you start living. If you put your attention onto fluffy kittens, after a while you start to become happier. A couple of months ago I was in a forest monastery and I caught COVID off this monk. I know, I know who, there's only three of us there, the abbot, this monk and me. So this monk, he'd already said that he was a bit ill and he's wiping his nose, he was coughing a bit. He wasn't bad. And then for five days, I was feeling a bit under the weather. I thought it was the monastery, I had nothing to do. It was in a tiny little room with a massive air conditioner. So it was either on and you freeze or you turn it off and you bake. And then I realized, I've got COVID. So I pointed at him, you've got COVID, you've given me COVID. He's like, no, 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 I don't have it. No, no, I don't have it. I tested, I had COVID. There's only three people here. But the other person was the abbot. He's the happiest person I've ever known. He always just like laughing and smiling. It doesn't matter what you throw at him. He's always just finds it amusing can be quite annoying for an Englishman. We like to grumble, we like to complain. So I said, oh, I've got COVID, and he's like, oh, never mind, it's COVID, smiling away. He just thinks happy thoughts. I wish I could do that, be like that. So it should arouse wisdom eventually that what I put my attention onto is what will start to determine my character. If I put my attention onto things that I dislike, I will start to become depressed or angry. I say this as somebody who spent the first 25 years of my life depressed and angry. Nobody had told me to pay attention to where I put my attention. No one told me I could change what thoughts I hold in the mind. But paying attention to this rather than that Having this as the object of my attention, it's a very important word in Buddhism, manasikara, in Thai, manasikara, means what you are attending to. And we attend to only one thing at a time. It flits around a lot. So the typical human being will flit around a lot, paying attention to different things, but probably less than you think. What happens is you la your mind that latches onto something, you get what's called bhava, becoming. Your mind becomes consciously engaged with that thing. So a couple of weeks ago, my conscious attention, my bhava became heavily involved with the women's football, soccer. I have always hated football. I have no interest in it, even though I used to live in Manchester People would always say, oh, man, you. I'm like, no, man, no, man, no. I don't care. But the women's team, the lionesses, were 
on track to win the World Cup. I got into it. And FIFA actually live streamed the Women's World Cup for free in Thailand. So I was there, come on, come on, shoot, shoot. I never cared about football before. I can't stand football, but once I put my attention onto it, and I want this team to win, we were playing against Australia the first game, and Spain. We lost to Spain. In English have a fantastic ability to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. So that becomes my object of attention. I put my attention onto that thing, the football, the game, and what I want from it. My attention is now caught in it. Every so often my attention will come back and, oh, that's right. I'm feeling a bit hungry. I need the bathroom. What time is it? That moment where the attention comes back, that's mindfulness arising. And the first thing you do when mindfulness arises and breaks you from the conscious engagement that you had, you look around something to fill that void, that space. I'll make a cup of tea. I'll make some coffee. Eat some Jaffa cakes. When that void arises, you immediately find something to do to distract yourself from it. You go make something, do something, go to sleep, move around. You realize your body's a bit stiff because we like to have our attention absorbed in something. Bhava, conscious engagement. Bhava is translated as becoming. Becoming or being. In Thai, it's pop, pop sound. It's due to the way they write bhava. They never write the letter A anyway. It's a Pali thing. So it comes to a point in time, as a meditator, you have to consider all my meditation has simply been switching this object for that object. My thoughts about football for my thoughts about something else. Dharma, giving talks, internet stuff, following the news, whatever it is, your attention then moves onto that, becomes consciously engaged with that. Yesterday it was the uh, UFC. <laughs> I'm a bit of a sucker for watching the martial arts. I had a friend who was actually dying, he passed away, but he uh, was an Aikido practitioner. While he was on his deathbed, the last year of his life, I would take him things to watch. So I'd take him mixed martial arts because he liked it. I didn't like it. I just wanted to be with my friend. But anyway, after a while, I found myself getting into it. The mind is switching one object for another object for another object, even when that object is meditation. You're putting your mind onto a meditation object with your eyes open or your eyes closed at the breath or at the abdomen with a mantra or silently, the visualization or emptiness. You're switching out the object for another object. It changes your state of mind, but you're still just moving from one thing to another thing. Hopefully wisdom arises and you will put attention onto things that won't cause you suffering, at least that are neutral or entertaining can be a real sucker for focusing on things that we dislike. I can. I can focus on politics and war and people and things. Probably shouldn't. So what happens then? Where is this enlightenment that the Buddha and other saints and sages have told us is real and is there? How do you get to that? Well, this entire process of perceiving things, perceiving objects, has to stop in order to move to something completely new. You may know the Zen idea. It actually predates Zen, but we associate it with Zen Buddhism. To fill a cup with clean water, you have to first pour out whatever was in the cup, then you can fill it with clean water. This means your mind, your consciousness, you have to empty out of everything before this new thing can arise. 
And switching your attention from object to object with meditation object is not it. You're just switching this rather than that. So at some point, this entire process of perceiving objects, putting your attention onto things, of directing your attention onto things, has to stop. Now, there's two ways, certainly in Abhidhamma Buddhism, of thinking of is directed thought and non-directed thought. Directed thought means you know what you are paying attention to, you've chosen it, and you are consciously putting attention onto it. So I was watching the women's football until we got beaten by Spain, then it's finished. I hope there's no one from Spain here, but I was cheering against you. I probably won't watch another game of football for another 30 years. How does this entire process stop? You have to empty out all of this, everything. Everything has to go in order to move into this new experience. So that is directed thinking. There is also non-directed thinking, which is where you don't have a particular theme or topic in mind. Your mind just bobs from one thing to another thing to another thing to another thing. And if you look at people on a bus or a train, usually that's what they're doing. They're just like, bum -ba -dum -ba -dum, thinking about food, thinking about tomorrow, thinking about their kids, thinking about their future, thinking about money. Bum -ba -dum -ba -dum, like a cork bobbing on the ocean. This is non-directed thinking. Directed thinking is where you know what your topic is and you're putting your attention onto it. You're watching the sports or the news or your breath or a visualization and you're doing it consciously with effort. What if you stop making the effort? What if you let that entire process of perceiving things come to a halt? Normally you will go into non-directed thinking. So your mind will start bobbing from thing to thing to thing. And meditators can spend many years in that state of mind. It's quite peaceful. It's quite soothing. Feels calm, calmer. You think you're making progress, but you're not really. The mind has to stop. And to stop requires energy, effort, but not the effort of putting attention onto anything. The world stops. You give up your history, your perceptions, your thoughts, your wants, your age, your children, your country. Give it all up. What's left when you just settle into that void? Crystal clear awareness. There are certain experiences that arise when you're doing this. Objectless meditation. Some of the experiences, you may feel the body become very large. You'll have a generalized body awareness. It may get stuck. So you may feel part of the body or, or maybe the whole body. But as it frees up, it will be a full body awareness without settling on any particular area. The body will become very pleasant to be in. Sure, if you have a bad back and you put attention onto that, it's still there. But while you hold yourself into this void, into this clear stillness, not an object of attention, not an object you are creating, then the body will start to become more pleasant to be in. It can energize. Sometimes like, like this, you feel like pumping through the body, but without effort, without ego, without making it happen or calling it up. Mind will also become very crystal clear, like brightness. I don't want to say light, because you can visualize lights. That is another object of attention that you are creating. This is brightness that arises naturally by itself. I'm telling you these things because very few meditation teachers will tell you about this, this stuff. 
they tell you about focus on the nose is better than the breath or focus on the body is better than the abdomen or focus on the this, 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 use the eyes open, close the eyes, sit in this posture, not that posture. They're swapping one object of attention for another. There was a time I was doing the walking meditation and you have to lift the heel, lift the foot, move, touch, press. And you're supposed to do this. And the teacher wanted you to like walk like a robot with jerky parts. Well, I focus on the stationary foot, not the moving foot. It's much easier to focus on the stationary foot in walking meditation. So my meditation, walking meditation, was very smooth. It's like, no, 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 you're not doing it right. If I focus on the moving foot, will I get enlightened? But I focus on the stationary foot, I'll not get enlightened. Really think about it. It's just one object or another object. I kind of asked him that, but he said, no, this is the correct way. So much of meditation in so many traditions. They get focused on the method. And the method is just putting attention onto this, not that. This has to stop. So some of these are experiences that come up as the entire process stops. But if you're not thinking, you're not moving, you're not creating, you're not attending to anything, you don't fall asleep. It energizes, becomes brighter, and becomes clearer. This is the mystery that saints and sages around the world have discovered and moved into. It feels beautiful feels right. It has a self-energizing aspect to it because it feels clear. And as the mind starts to sh shake out of it, you can feel that clearly. Your mind latches back into normal mode of being. This is what we call the end of the world. You come to the end of the world. So there is a sutta. I've tried to talk a little bit kind of beginner stuff just in case people here knew, but I really want to go into like hardcore dharma, dharma with cajones, uh, because that's what I do. This particular sutta is called the Rohitasa Sutta. Rohitasa was a person who came to see the Buddha, and he says, how far across the universe do we have to travel to reach the end of the universe and the end of suffering. And the Buddha said, it doesn't matter how far you travel in the universe, you will never, ever come to the end of the universe or the end of suffering. Rohitasa says to the Buddha, this is fantastic. In my previous existence, I was a deva of great power. And with one stride, I could cover an ocean in his psychic body. He said, so I strode and I strode and I went as far as I could, stopping only to replenish with food. And I strode across the whole universe, but I never reached the end. He said, so the words you are saying are true. No matter how far you travel, you will never reach the end of the universe or the end of suffering. Then the Buddha says to him, this is true. But until you reach the end of the universe, you will never reach the end of suffering. So I say to you, practice for the end of the universe or the world. For I tell you, within this fathom length body is the world, the arising of the world and the cessation of the world. Okay, so this is sutta language. This is the way that the teachings are recorded. Until you come to the end of the world, you will never know the end of suffering. So the Buddha says, no matter how far you go, that's not going to help you. You have to bring this process to a stop. Within this fathom length body, with its perceptions, with its perceptions, sanya is the word, if you know Pali, is the world, the arising of the world and the cessation of the world. Until you know the cessation of the world, you will not know the end of suffering. That was the teaching. 
This story reappeared centuries later in China, in the journey to the West. Are you all familiar with the journey to the West? With the monkey, the pig, the sand spirit, the horse, and the monk, five of them, and they go traveling? Is that, you'll just shake your head if you've no idea what I'm talking about. No idea, a few people. Okay, so probably the greatest of all Chinese literature was a book called The Journey to the West, where a group of travelers leave China and they go to India to find the true teachings of Buddhism to bring them back to China. The five travelers who go is a monkey spirit, which in the text, the name means mind attained to emptiness. It's like a monkey because it can swing, it can do anything. It's very powerful. A sand spirit, which represents religion. I can tell you why, but it, uh, it takes a long time. A pig spirit that represents greed or desire. A horse that represents thought. And a monk who represents aspiration or ego. These five characters are five parts of your psyche, but they're five characters in the story, and they encounter all kinds of difficulties, and then it's either the horse or the monkey or the pig will solve the problem, allow them to go on. In the story, when monkey is born, monkey is the mind attained to emptiness, he goes up to the heavenly realms and he causes great trouble in the heavenly realms because to keep him happy, they gave him a job as protector of the horses, which means looking after your thoughts. But he let the horses run around without governing them, which means you've let the mind be scattered. So heavenly realms got into disarray because of monkey. And eventually he declared himself equal to heaven and heavenly realms said, this is no good. And they sent a messenger from Kuan Yin to fight him. And there's this great battle between monkey and the forces of heaven. So in the story, after he'd gone through the battle with heaven, he winds up in the Buddha's hand. He's sitting in the Buddha's hand. It's a terrific uh, part of the story, a very famous part of the story. So he's a little monkey spirit sat there talking to Buddha. And the Buddha says, okay, you've caused all this trouble with heaven. You've shown that you can disrupt the entire universe. I will make you master of the entire universe if you can escape my hand. Monkey thinks, it's easy. I can travel anywhere I want. So he jumps out of the hand, zooms along, and he goes all the way to the end of the universe, the physical extent of the universe. He's like, there's nowhere further away that I can get from the Buddha's hand. And while he's there at the end of the universe, there are five pillars. So just to prove to Buddha that he was at the end of the universe, he writes his name on one of the pillars. Monkey was here. And on the other pillar, he urinates, makes his mark. And he flies all the way back, lands in the Buddha's hand. And says, there you are, Buddha. I escaped your hand. I got all the way to the end of the universe. Do you know what happened? Do you remember this part of the story? Buddha says to monkey, you never left my hand. And the five pillars at the end of the universe are the five fingers. And there, written on the Buddha's finger, monkey was here. And there on the other pillar was the smell of the monkey's urine. Buddha says, you never left the palm of my hand. Failed to escape. And then <laughs> splats him on the ground and imprisons him under a five-fingered mountain, which means putting him into a physical body. And that's how monkey was defeated. So this is the same story, the Rohitasa that I told you. He asked the Buddha, how far do I travel to get to the end of the universe? The Buddha said, you will never escape. So the meaning of this story is, whatever perception you bring into the mind, remember the Buddha said, uh, in this fathom length body with its perceptions is the universe arising of the universe, cessation of the universe. So the meaning of the story is this. Any perception that you can bring into your mind, any state of mind, that isn't it. You haven't escaped. You have to bring this process, this world, to a stop. Then you come to the end of suffering. So the process of doing this, of course, you will need a meditation object. 
and practice to get started, to settle yourself into the right position. But there will come time in your meditation when attention suddenly comes back, even leaving your meditation object. You have a feeling of, I call it, here I am, or I'm back. Feeling of, oh yeah, that's the escape right there, the saranat, refuge, the escape. If you can hold on to that, this brightness will start to arise by itself, and you're not doing anything. You're not perceiving a particular object. However, there is this perception of becoming into the body, of brightness, uh, and of energization. This is the real meditation. This has nothing to do with Theravada Buddhism, or Zen Buddhism, or Vajrayana Buddhism, or Advaita, or Vedanta, and all of these different schools around the world. You've gone past the need for schools, and you're going directly into the actual mystic union in Christianity. It's called union with God. You go into that itself. Just to finish off, I want to make clear that this now attainment of feeling is actually real. It does not depend on your notions, your preconceptions. It doesn't depend on your religion or your, your teacher or your teachings. This is actually the real experience itself. Something like... If I say the economy, the economy depends on your definition of it. If I say democracy, it depends on what you think about by democracy. But if I say Australia, well, Australia is really there. It actually exists. It's true and it's real, independent of what you think about it. So in the same way, this experience is actually real. It is not belonging to any particular school. It's not Buddhism rather than Christianity or Christian mystic rather than a Sufi mystic. This is the actual stepping beyond. It's incontrovertible and it's free from your opinions and views and religion because all of that stuff had to be emptied out in order for this new thing to arise. So this is what I'm going to leave you with, the encouragement or the suggestion that these attainments actually are within your purview. These states actually are something that you can find and touch on. It is there within you, within your experience. It's there to be found. It's there to be practiced for. So I want to leave you with this uh, reflection.